Hey everyone, uh, thanks for joining us today. I hope the conference is, is going well for everyone. Uh, I know there's a lot of interesting talks and content out there. So in this talk, we're going to focus on adding custom logic to our GraphQL API using Cypher. So we're gonna take kind of a, a deep dive into using Cypher with the Neo4j GraphQL library. So my name is Will. I work on the developer relations team at Neo4j. Um, I publish a, a blog and, and a newsletter that's linked there, lionwj.com. And that's also my Twitter handle, lionwj, which is I guess, probably the, the best way to keep up with what uh, I'm working on these days. Uh, I also co-host the graphstuff.fm podcast uh, with my colleague Lou. So if you like the podcast format and you're interested in graphs, uh, definitely check that out. That might be something of interest uh, for you. So there are uh, a handful of talks at Nodes today focused on GraphQL. Uh, earlier today, we heard from Daryl giving us an overview of the Neo4j GraphQL library. Uh, then Dan gave us a deep dive on adding authorization to our GraphQL API. Uh, and then, of course, now we're hearing about uh, using Cypher with GraphQL for custom logic. Immediately after this session, uh, Arif in the apps and API track, so not this track, you have to jump over to a different track uh, immediately after my talk if you want to hear this one, but he's going to be talking about using the brand new Neo4j integration for hot chocolate, which is a .NET GraphQL server. So if you're interested in Neo4j and GraphQL in the .NET ecosystem, definitely check that talk out. And of course, all these are recorded, so if you miss them, you can catch the recordings uh, as well. Great, so in this talk over the next I don't know, 30 minutes or so, what I want to do is go through adding custom logic features to a GraphQL API for a specific application, uh, and that is a news graph. Uh, so I've pulled in some data from the New York Times API, uh, and I've loaded that into Neo4j already. So we have a Neo4j database with um, things like articles, articles that uh, have topics, articles mention people, we know the author of, the article, we know what geographical region these articles are referring to. Uh, so we have this data in Neo4j. And what I want to go through is, is go through our list of sort of business requirements here to see how we can add logic to our GraphQL API to expose these features for our client application. So things like show me the most recent articles, let me search by search term, uh, how, how are comments going to work, how can I create comments, think about authorization around that. Um, how can I show personalized recommendations? So either based on my viewing history or based on articles I'm looking at, what are other articles that I might be interested in? So we're going to go through uh, building out a GraphQL API using the Neo4j GraphQL library uh, for this data set and just look at how we add these features uh, to match our requirements. So before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about comparing and, and contrasting Cypher and GraphQL. So Cypher is very much a graph database query language. Uh, with Cypher, we have these declarative pattern matching uh, paradigms that we use ASCII art notation to define these sort of graph patterns that we want to work with. And then just like any other database query language, we have functions for doing things like aggregations, math functions, uh, database operations, like creating indexes, data import, like pulling in CSV files, these sorts of things. But then because it's a graph database query language, we have graph specific operations as well, like variable length path operator, uh, functions for working with nodes, relationships, path, uh, these kind of things. So compare that to GraphQL, which is not a database query language. Rather, it's a query language for APIs, but also uh, a runtime for fulfilling these requests. With GraphQL, we have a type system. 
that clearly defines the data that's available to the client of the API and how that data is connected. This is the, the data graph. So that's where the graph in GraphQL comes from. So while GraphQL is modeling our application data as a graph, we can really use any uh, backend system to resolve data for our GraphQL API. It's not uh, specific to graph databases. We can even federate data from multiple sources, pulling from multiple databases, other APIs, uh, these sorts of things. And the way that we traverse this data graph in GraphQL is by creating this sort of nested structure called a selection set, where we're sort of specifying uh, at query time how we want to traverse through that data graph and exactly what fields we want to be returned. So let's look at some examples specific to this news data set that we're working with. So uh, one of the requirements was uh, show me all of the articles that are available. So in Cypher, we might do something like this. Uh, so a match clause with this graph pattern that we're looking for is a common way to use Cypher. Uh, and here, the parentheses around article uh, represent a node, so that's a node pattern. So we're saying, we're saying find all nodes with the label article and return those, and we get back a bunch of nodes. In GraphQL, it would look something like this. Uh, so we start with a uh, entry point for our GraphQL API is a field on a special type called the query type. And then we specify in our selection set how we want to traverse the data graph, what fields we want to bring back. And in this case, we're just bringing back the title and abstract fields on the article. So let's now, instead of just giving me all the articles, let's look at just the 10 most recent. And in Cypher, we have uh, ordering, we have uh, pagination uh, ability. So here we're saying order by the published date, give me just the, the most recent 10 articles. And that's what we get back. In GraphQL, uh, sorting and this pagination skip limit is not really built into GraphQL. It's not part of the GraphQL specification. Um, it's up to the implementer of the GraphQL API to sort of choose how they want to handle that. Uh, but in general, we can handle this idea uh, of sorting and, and limiting results with field arguments. So, OK, now let's say, give me the most recent 10 articles and also their topics. And remember, we're modeling topics as another node connected to the article because it's useful to be able to traverse from an article to the topics to other articles that are connected to those same topics. So to do that, um, in this case, in, in Cypher, it's a little more complicated here because we, we have to first find the first 10 articles, order those by date, uh, and then we have another match clause. In this case, it's, it's an optional match because not all articles are connected to topics. Uh, but for the articles that are, we want to traverse the graph. And so we define this graph pattern. So you can see we're sort of drawing this ASCII art notation again for the, the article node A that's bound to this variable A that we can refer to later, where we're saying follow this outgoing has topic relationship. You can see we're kind of drawing an arrow there to find uh, the topic nodes. And in GraphQL, we do this by adding uh, onto our selection set. So our selection set now becomes this nested structure where we're, we've added topics. Uh, and for every topic, we want to bring back the name field. Now, what if our, our graph pattern is a little more complex? Now, for every topic, we also want to know other articles that are in uh, that are connected to those topics. And to do that in Cypher, we just add on to our graph pattern here. Now, in addition to following this outgoing has topic relationship, we're also going to follow the incoming has topic relationship to find other articles, return those, and we get uh, a little subgraph here. And in GraphQL, we just keep adding on to our nested selection set. So now, under the topics selection, we've now added articles. Uh, so that says traverse from the topics to other articles and return the title of those other articles. So, so far, we've been able to represent both uh, in Cypher and GraphQL what we're looking for. Um, what about more complex graph operations? So 
let's say, can we find the shortest path from Vladimir Putin to the topic extortion and blackmail? So in Cypher, it looks like this. Um, there's a couple of interesting things going on here. One is this concept of the variable length path operation. And that's right here in the middle, this asterisk, uh, and then the dot, dot, nine in our brackets where we're defining our relationship pattern. And what this is saying is find a pattern that connects this person node with the name Vladimir Putin to the topic node, extortion and blackmail, but follow an arbitrary number of relationships. So variable length path. Uh, and this dot, dot, nine means go up to nine hops deep. Uh, and then the shortest path function will execute a binary breadth first search to see uh, the shortest path where these two nodes are connected. And it ends up being not a very long path, just through one article uh, about uh, the hacking of the Colonial Pipeline recently. Uh, and that's what we get back. Now in GraphQL, we don't really have anything built in to represent this concept of the shortest path or variable length traversal. We could build a GraphQL API that incorporates uh, this functionality would define that on the back end, but it's it's not something that's sort of built into GraphQL. Uh, let's look at another example. So this is one of our requirements to show me recommended articles. So if you're looking at an article, what are other articles you might be interested in? Uh, in Cypher, we have lots of different ways that, that we could do this. In this case, we're looking for um, articles that share either an author or a topic or a geographical region, right? So if I'm reading uh, an article that's about, I don't know, San Francisco Bay Area, maybe I'm interested in other articles about that same geographic area. Yeah, and you can see here, here's the, the article we're, look, we're looking at initially on the left and the recommended articles are on the right that go through either the author node or through some of the topic nodes. And in GraphQL, again, we don't really have this concept uh, built in of how we can express this. And again, we could add this sort of logic in the back end to our GraphQL API, but it's not something that's built in to the language. So hopefully that's helpful to think about uh, the powers of GraphQL, Cypher, when we want to use one, when we want to use other, th things that we get uh, with uh, with Cypher that maybe aren't available in GraphQL, how GraphQL works for uh, querying data from the API client. Let's think about how we can leverage GraphQL and Cypher together. So let's say now we're ready to build a uh, React application for our news graph. We have our data in a, a NeoVJ Aura cluster. Well, we don't want to just have all the, the clients querying our database directly. We don't want to just expose the database to the world. We don't want arbitrary queries to be executed against our database. We don't have, want to think about how we want to handle application users and application authorization. Uh, and so for that reason, we build this API layer that sits between the database and the client. Uh, and in this case, we want to use GraphQL. Maybe we deploy that as an AWS Lambda function. And now our client, our React application, is speaking GraphQL to our GraphQL API. And our GraphQL API is speaking Cypher to our Neo4j Aura cluster. OK, so that begs the question, how do we build this GraphQL API? Uh, well, maybe a, an initial naive, call it a naive approach might be, let's just take some Cypher and use the Neo4j driver and in the resolver function. So resolver functions, that's uh, how we actually resolve these GraphQL requests. Uh, just use the driver to execute the Cypher query and return the results. And that works. And in fact, that's an approach we took for uh, the activity feeds that you see on the uh, Neo4j community site. And although this, this introduces some problems, though, um, it's fine if we have just a, a single query that we want to, to run and expose the data, which is, which is the case we have in the activity feeds. But oftentimes, in an application, we have much more complex interactions that we have. Uh, and this can introduce what's called the n plus one query problem, where we end up making multiple requests to the back end. We have to think about batching and caching. So a more uh, sophisticated approach might be something like this, uh, which is a demo that Michael Simons from the Neo4j SDN team put together, which uses the Spring Data Neo4j integration along with the Netflix uh, DGS GraphQL implementation 
to build a GraphQL API, uh, leveraging some of the, the query generation from Spring Data, but also leveraging some of the built-in batching and caching functionality in Netflix GGS using the data loader pattern. Uh, but now what if we, we want a much more, uh, a way to get started much more quickly, sort of generating the API for us, not really having to think about how to uh, generate some of that data fetching logic. And that's where the NeoFJ GraphQL library comes in. Um, so I'm gonna, gonna kind of skip over the, a lot of the functionality of the NeoFJ GraphQL API uh, since there were a couple of other talks from, uh, from Dan and Daryl er earlier today. So definitely check those out if you missed them. But basically with the NeoFJ GraphQL API, we take GraphQL type definitions and use that to drive the data model in, uh, in NeoFJ and the database. So here, we're pulling in our dependencies. We're creating some uh, GraphQL type definitions, a connection to Neo4j using Neo4j driver. We don't have to implement any resolvers. We can just spin up uh, an Apollo server, and we have all of our CRUD operations generated for us. So we can create data. We can query it. We can use pagination, filtering, uh, all of these kinds of things. Now what's going on at query time is we pass uh, an arbitrary GraphQL query, uh, GraphQL operation, I should say rather, uh, since this can include mutations as well, to the GraphQL API that we've built using the NeoFJ GraphQL library. And it has the logic for generating a database query from that arbitrary GraphQL request using Cypher in this case. Uh, and we also project out just the fields that are requested in the GraphQL query. OK, so we talked about CRUD operations. That then begs the question, how do we add custom logic then to our GraphQL API? And this is where what I think is one of the most powerful features in the NeoFJ GraphQL library comes in, and that is the Cypher GraphQL schema directive. So schema directives are GraphQL's sort of built-in extension mechanism that says, hey, some custom logic needs to happen here on the server. So this directive is implemented in the NeoFJ GraphQL library uh, and allows us to add Cypher statements to our GraphQL schema. So here we're defining a computed field on the topic type. We're adding an article count field that uh, the value of is mapped to this Cypher statement. So we're looking at uh, the number of articles connected to this topic. That's the article count. So now when I include article count in the selection set, that Cypher query that I've attached in the schema runs as a sort of subquery in the single database query that is generated. Uh, so we're still able to generate a single database query addressing that in plus one query problem, but uh, we're doing that now with some custom user-defined logic. So we saw how to do this for a computed scalar field. That's the article count. Um, we saw if we add article count to our selection set, now that Cypher query runs and we get back the results. We can also use Cypher directives on uh, node in object fields or object array fields. So here we're adding sort of a, that recommended recommendation query that we saw earlier where we're looking for articles with overlapping articles uh, articles overlapping authors or uh, topics to show here are similar articles you might be interested in, and we're returning article nodes as a recommendation. So when I add the similar field now to my selection set, uh, I can grab, uh, in this case, we're just grabbing the title. And we can see here for articles we're looking at, here are similar articles you might be interested in. Now, oftentimes it's useful to be able to pass in field arguments in uh, our GraphQL query at query time. So in this case, we can specify the number of similar articles, number of recommended articles to return. Uh, here we're setting a default value of three, uh, and then we can reference that in our Cypher statement because those uh, field arguments are passed as Cypher parameters to our Cypher statement. So here we're saying, OK, only show me the first two recommended articles. Uh, and that's what we get back. We can also use the Cypher directive on custom query fields. So 
one feature that's really powerful for search in Neo4j is the full text index functionality. So we can create a full text index and then use Lucene query syntax, kind of like what you'd see in, in Elasticsearch uh, to do say like fuzzy matching. So here we're creating a full text index that we're calling article index on the article node, bringing in the title and abstract properties. So another nice thing is I can combine node labels and multiple properties into a single index to search, which is quite nice. So here we're creating a custom query field called article search. And we're querying that full text index that we created, passing in the search string that's provided at query time. Uh, and we add this tilde at the end, which is Lucene query syntax for fuzzy matching. So if we have some slight misspelling, we'll still return results. So if a user is searching for uh, news articles about Montana, but maybe they misspell it, we'll still find results because we're using uh, that fuzzy matching functionality of our full text index. Now in the, the keynote presentation, uh, I think it was Cameron from Meredith who was talking about using um, APOC to enable scalability uh, for their use case. So APOC is this super powerful standard library that's available with Neo4j that extends Cypher with lots of different functionality. Uh, let's see how we can use APOC in a Cypher directive because after all, we have access to Cypher procedures through the Cypher directive. Uh, and in this case, we'll add some federated data to our GraphQL API using the Google Knowledge Graph API. So the Google Knowledge Graph has an API. Uh, we have people in our news graph. So let's search the Google Knowledge Graph to bring back their biographies. So we have that data available. So here we're adding a description field on the person type and attaching a Cypher statement that's doing a couple of things with APOC. First, uh, we've stored our key for the Google Knowledge Graph uh, API in a configuration file, so you don't have to make that secret available. Then we're using APOC load JSON to call out to the uh, Google Knowledge Graph API, searching for results for uh, whatever person we're resolving. Uh, and then we grab the detail description field uh, from the result. So now we have this description field available in our GraphQL API, uh, and we get back data alongside our data from Neo4j. We get back data from the Google Knowledge Graph. So in this article, this is what the article about Amazon buying MGM. We have a couple of people mentioned, uh, Barbara Broccoli. Now we have some information about who that is and some information about who Jeff Bezos is. So that's really useful. Uh, there's lots of other things we can do with APOC. All this functionality is available to us through Cypher. Uh, we also saw in the keynote earlier today the power of machine learning and graph algorithms with graph data science. Uh, and again, because this functionality is exposed through Cypher procedures, we can make use of these in our GraphQL API using the Cypher schema directive. Uh, so let's use the jacquard similarity function to improve our article recommendation query. So jacquard similarity, this is like a, a set comparison operation uh, where we get a score that shows us how similar two sets are. And in this case, the sets are going to be uh, topics connected to articles. So we'll change that similar uh, Cypher query on the article type to first for the article that we're resolving, find all the topics, uh, and then we will use the uh, GDS similarity jacquard function to find the other article nodes that are most similar uh, according to jacquard and return those. So now when we look at uh, similar articles, we can take a look, uh, this first one here, is a story about um, children's author who died. Similar articles we can see are about libraries uh, and books, so that sounds pretty good. The other article is, again, that Amazon buying MGM article, and we get back other articles about movies. Um, so that, that looks pretty good as well. 
okay, so we, we, we've talked kind of about like the world of, of the possible, what can we do with the Cypher directive for adding custom logic? Let's talk a little bit about things that we should do, maybe things that we shouldn't do, uh, right? So, so sort of best practices and, and takeaways for using the Cypher directive. Uh, and there's uh, a handful of observations that, uh, that I'll go through here. So let's just jump into those. So the first is regarding uh, schema design and the distinction between the relationship directive and the Cypher directive. So we know that topics are connected to articles. So we could add uh, a topics field on the article type that looks like this, that uses a Cypher query to go out and, and find the connected topics. Uh, we could do that and, and that would work, but we shouldn't do that. Uh, instead, what we should do is use the relationship directive to indicate that connection, to define that relationship. And the reason for that is um, this will allow the Cypher generation process in the NeoFJ GraphQL library to take advantage of uh, expressing those graph traversals and allow the Cypher execution engine to optimize those queries. That's something uh, a graph database is really, really good at, traversing from one node to another. Uh, and if we sort of abstract that away into a Cypher query, which runs as a subquery, we're, we're going to not leverage that same performance. Um, another takeaway here is to leverage the auto-generated filters. Uh, this is a really powerful feature, and there's a lot of filters that are exposed. So here's an example. Uh, here we've written a custom query field geosearch that takes a latitude and longitude uh, and then goes looking for articles connected to this geographic region that are within one kilometer. And, and we could do this, uh, but we don't need to. Uh, instead, just by defining a point type in our schema, so we have a location on the geo node that is a point type, so just by adding that in our schema and saying, hey, this is a point type in the database, we have this distance filter available to us. So we can actually do this as part of the generated logic without having to write any Cypher uh, directives. The other point I want to make here is that we can also auto-generate data using some directives in our schema rather than writing Cypher directives. So here's an example. We've created a custom mutation field for creating comments uh, that takes a user ID, comment text, and an article ID. And then we've defined how to create that comment and connect that comment node to the user and the article in Cypher. And we're leveraging uh, the timestamp function and this random UUID function so that when we create this data, uh, we don't want the client to have to pass like a new ID for the comment or to pass like the current time. We want that to be generated on the server. So we can do that in Cypher, um, but we, we don't need to do that. Um, instead, we can add this ID directive on the comment ID field. And this says, uh, okay, when this is created, I want to auto generate a UUID for the comment. Uh, and similarly, for this created field that's a date time, I give that the timestamp directive. And that means uh, that I want to uh, auto generate a timestamp when this is created or updated. And I, I could configure that if I just want it to be set when it's created or also when it's updated. And the next point has to do with nested mutations. So, if we look at this custom mutation field that we created, we are using uh, some custom cipher that we wrote here to create the comment node and then create two relationships. So this is sort of creating a, a, a little piece of a subgraph. And we talked about using the timestamp and the random UUID function, um, but we don't even need to create that mutation field because we can leverage the nested mutation functionality that is available for us just generated from the type definitions. So here we're using the create comments mutation uh, that takes an input text, so the, the text for the comment. Uh, and then with the nested mutation functionality for the author, we can specify 
Do we want to connect to an existing author node and look that up by ID? Do we want to create the author node? Here we're just connecting and doing something similar for article. So in this case, we don't even need to define that custom mutation. We have that available to us that is part of the auto-generated API. Uh, and here you can see the auto-generated UUID and the timestamp that was generated because we used the ID and timestamp directives. The final example I have uh, has to do with authorization. Um, so earlier, Dan gave us this, this deep dive into the authorization functionality available in uh, the NeoFJ GraphQL library. We can leverage some of that in these Cypher directive fields. So uh, the NeoFJ GraphQL library uses JSON web token for authentication and authorization. And uh, that token is verified and then passed in uh, I should say the payload of that token is passed in to our Cypher query uh, under this auth Cypher parameter. So here we're saying, okay, only show comments that the, the currently authenticated user wrote, right? So this new query field, my comments, it's going to show me only my comments. And I can do that. And again, this, th this works, but I don't need to. Um, instead, if I wanted to restrict the comments to only those authored by the currently authenticated user, I could add an auth directive with a, ru a where rule that says uh, filter where the username matches the jwt.sub. So that's the subscriber, the currently authenticated user making this request. So I guess the takeaway there is um, one, make sure that when you're using the Cypher directive, it's not something that can be specified using relationship directives as you're defining uh, your schema. Uh, and then make sure that the feature that you're implementing with a custom Cypher field isn't already available as part of the generated GraphQL API, um, because there are a lot of powerful things there. Great. So that uh, is all I have to talk about. Um, I will leave you with a few resources. So these slides are available, dev.neofj.com slash cypher graphql. Um, also, the neofj graphql library docs and overview page have a lot more information. Uh, there's a, a full day Graph Academy training that goes through a lot of this functionality in an interactive way. You get a certificate when you're done. Um, so that might be something to check out as well. Uh, and then we didn't really talk about what do you do with this GraphQL API once you've created, how do you integrate it with your full stack application? Uh, and this is where GrandStack, so GraphQL, React, Apollo, and EFJ database, uh, that's where that comes in. There's a GrandStack starter project that you can clone from GitHub or run this uh, NPX create GrandStack app command that will also provision uh, a new API for you. Cool. So thanks for, thanks so much uh, for joining us today. Uh, and again, if you have any questions, be sure to drop those in the chat uh, and we'll get to those in the Q&A panel. Thanks. Cheers. <laughs>